call forward our next panelist, Professor Sayed Manzurul Islam, who will be talking about the sense of sight. After us for what forgiveness? <laughs> <laughs> he stole the show. Um, as far as he said that um, the nose is the center of the face. Remove the eyes and see how the face looks like. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing much. Okay. Now, when the lottery was cast, I was given the eyes, and I expected it to be a kind of informal conversation amongst us. But I now see that everyone is damn prepared. With notes and quotations and philosophers. And Fakrul um, is always very sound. Academically sound, today was very sound with his preparation. Gulam Sarwar, because of his six plus height, <laughs> always floats in very um, refined atmosphere. So he always catches the six senses as a whole. <laughs> and he was true to his, um, uh, true to his vocation. Kaiser has a taste for the very refined. <laughs> very prohibitive. <laughs> Look at the uh, wine glass. I wonder, I mean, we do not have any of these objectionable things here. As far as the rose, which is fantastic. But I wonder why Kaisar is given that. But you have heard him, and so I'm all for the taste that Kaisar likes to transmit to everyone. And uh, as far, of course, manners. A good argument from 12,000 miles away. <laughs> he can smell a rat or a rat shit and a rose everywhere. <laughs> Shamshad, I am so unhappy to see him coming after me, but that's alphabetical luck. <laughs> and he feels through everything. He feels through Dhaka traffic. If anyone can feel through Dhaka traffic driving his car, cannot see anything, but feels through Dhaka traffic, he is a superman. And he's the one who thought this thing and gave me the eye. What can I say about the eye? Well, I grew up at a time when the visual was less electronic, more natural. I grew up in a town called Sidet, a very conservative town where women were not allowed to go to the films alone. They had to be accompanied by a male, and the male could be from 7 to 77. <laughs> so I belonged to that category of male when I was in school. So the apas and mashimas and khalas of the neighborhood got me as their uh, chaperone, and I went to the films. Yeah, well, not in the sense that I didn't have the sense. Okay. That's not <laughs> Annas, eight Annas at the time. That was more luck than spending time in the middle of these women. <laughs> they were all very senior, so I was a good boy though. <laughs> and while the film was going on, mostly Uttam Shuchitra films. So my eyes are full of the images of this childhood. I, I, I see splendor, I see elegance everywhere. So that has saved me in a sense. But the intimate moments came and uh, don't have your hopes high. The intimate moments were <laughs> Uttam sitting across the table, holding a hand of Shuchitra's hand and having a cup of tea. <laughs> that was the intimate moment. And my khalas and appas turned my face away. <laughs> I was not allowed, I was censored. <laughs> that scene was censored. And I grew up with a sense of what is watchable, lookable, gazeable, and what is not. And that is something I found as I studied liter literature. How much to see and what not to see. This is a very good balance. What I see now is a surfeit of the screens. Remember, when I grew up, there's only one screen, the matinee show screen. And screens are everywhere. You have your iPad, your iPod, your mobile phone a smartphone, everything has screens. And while we were having a fantastic conversation, I could see many of you 
Facebooking on your screen. You are lost in some other dimension. Imagine without the eyes, what could you have done? Fail the Braille, Braille way or what? <laughs> anyway, so the visual is everywhere now and one situationist, anarchist, Marxist, as far as we're very happy with this. <laughs> the devolved had written a book. <laughs> I, I know he's not anarchist, but he's mildly situationist. Not normative. I'm also giving you some theory. Without which, how can I justify my inclusion in a panel where everyone is giving theory? <laughs> and so he says we are living in a society of the spectacle, where the image is the most important dominant in our culture. Imagine what has happened to those childhood innocence days in which the beautiful was beautiful and now things can be photoshopped. <laughs> so your eyes are continuously deceived and you are always facing a challenge what to believe and what to not. That doubt translates into an existential crisis. How can you distinguish between what you see and what you do not see? So hyper real, hyper visual. That is the situation we are now. Even then, the eyes are important. Perhaps because the eyes serve the most important sense, which is vision. And screens everywhere, but what you have here is also visual agency. This term I am using in honor of Kushi Kobir. And see how eyes have translated and transmitted into many uh, into dimensions. For example, you have something called a gaze. And students of literature have to struggle with the female, uh, the male gaze. Mercifully, now you have female gaze for people like Kushi Kobir, who have developed this counter gaze. So what is a male gaze? It's something that destroys the pleasure of seeing. It imposes restrictions on what you can see, how you value what you see. The male gaze is terribly disturbing. And that is a pair of eyes that male wears, which has gone through many transmutations. And now in our time, the male gaze is so strong, I think women cower under this gaze. And that is not that's the reason why eyes transform into gazes. What about the other thing? The meanings which I, the eyes convey. Last night I was expecting to write down something, but a friend of mine came and we got lost into the memories of childhood and we had no sense of time. So I got, woke up this morning, I, was, I didn't want to really write down whatever I wanted to feel like. But I remember while I was taking classes on visual imagery and what, the, the eyes also suggest omniscience and clairvoyance. Remember Shakespeare? He says, your eyes are windows to your soul. So this gaze inward is a very important thing. You have also your mind's eye. It's not the physical eye only. And I believe removing the mind's eye is more damaging than removing the physical eyes. I was teaching a course, I'm teaching a course in master's class here. I'm teaching Dr. Um, King Lear. I also translated this play to Bangla and you have blindness figuring prominently in the play. So what is blindness when you lose your vision? So imagine how the transmission and transmutation of the whole eye thing is going on. Eyes, if eyes tell you about meaning, what about meaninglessness? How many of you have read the fantastic novel The Great Gatsby? The Great Gatsby, yeah. Remember this T.J. Ackerberg, the character whose eyes are painted on a billboard be spectacle eyes, right? And he is looking down on the Valley of Ashes. Is it God looking down on the American wasteland? I'm sure God is looking down on the American wasteland now when Trump is in power. <laughs> and, but at the end of the novel, we realize it could be meaningless gaze. So eyes can also become meaningless. Now imagine yourself in a situation which we are, we are all going through the country through in this country. The uh, section 57, 
a journalist um, jailed briefly for writing about a dead goat. <laughs> now, eyes are not the most important thing in this consideration. It is the eye of the mind which has been blinded. This is what happens in a situation where your eyes are blinded, your judgment is stunted, and you lose track of what you are doing. It's like King Lear moving through the storm in the heat and discovering that he had lost his vision a long time before he set foot on the heat. And Shakespeare is all about eyes and eyelessness and how eyes can be regained. So thank you for listening to my theory. Now the last thing I want to see about the eyes is a book um, I recently read, I, I had a long time ago read, I recently reread the book, it's called Ways of Seeing by John Barger. I would rather ask you to read this book because it's a wonderful book which tells you how many ways you can see, ways of seeing. One way of seeing, of course, I believe, is seeing the world through the eyes of childhood. I still value that childhood when I didn't have so many screens. In fact, as I said, I had only one screen. And I could see innocence in the eyes of people. And beauty everywhere. What is happening to this world? You take a walk in Dhaka and you would end up being the saddest person here. Dhaka is a very challenging city. It challenges your senses, your taste, and it is a circuit of sound destroys the fine balance in your ear but at the end of the day just get into a roof and look out into the night sky and you will see yourself reminiscing about your childhood sky which is never blighted. So that innocence is something that literature tells you. Once again um, I'm finishing my with a, with, a, with a small, referring to as a poem that I once read in my childhood. It's about a blind girl who is being led to the uh, pond and she cannot see anything, she can only feel, she can only touch. But then suddenly something happens in her because she is homebound girl, as you in villages, a blind girl is totally homebound. Suddenly she discovers something her mind side. And she sees herself as the empowered person who can throw her eyes, gaze into the world and say, I'm here. That is the strength which eyes give you. Thank you very much.